see how it rides. Amen? And uh, that, that will be good. That will be good. Uh, Brother Tommy, I need you to meet with us tonight, if you would, please, uh, after the service. Turn in your Bible now to Psalm 147. Psalm 147. Also, uh, in the next few weeks, I need to meet with the Building and Grounds Committee. I'll say something about that a little bit later on, but I need to meet with you, and we'll be announcing the date uh, on that. So please remember that. Those that are on the Building and Grounds Committee uh, need to meet with you also in the next few weeks. All right, Psalm 147, and in Psalm 147, I believe that the theme would be the greatness and gentleness of our God. The greatness and gentleness of our God. Psalm 147, beginning in verse 1. Praise ye the Lord, for it is good to sing praises unto our God, for it is pleasant and praise is comely. The Lord doth build up Jerusalem. He gathereth together the outcast of Israel. He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. He telleth the number of the stars. He calleth them all by their names. Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. The Lord lifteth up the meek. He causeth the, or casteth the wicked down to the ground. Sing unto the Lord with thanksgiving. Sing praises upon the harp unto our God. Who covereth the heaven with clouds, who prepareth rain for the earth, who maketh grass to grow upon the mountains. He giveth to the beast his food, and to the young ravens which cry. He delighteth not in the strength of the horse. He taketh not pleasure in the legs of a man. The Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him, in those that hope in his mercy. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise thy God, O Zion. For he hath strengthened the bars of thy gates. He hath blessed thy children within thee. He maketh peace in thy borders, and filleth thee with the finest of the wheat. He sendeth forth his commandment upon the earth. His word runneth very swiftly. He giveth snow like wool. Uh, he uh, scattereth the hoarfrost like ashes. He casteth forth his ice like morsels. Who can stand before his cold? He sendeth out his word and melteth them. He causeth his wind to blow and the waters flow. He showeth his word unto Jacob, his statutes and his judgments unto Israel. He hath not dealt so with any nation. And as for his judgments, they have not known them. Praise ye the Lord. What a tremendous, tremendous psalm. We could spend weeks in just this one passage of Scripture. But just for tonight, the greatness and the gentleness of our God. Pray with us if you will. Lord, we love you tonight. And uh, we want to know you more and more and more. And Father, we know that the greatest knowledge is to know thee. And uh, so we ask that you will help us to be men and women of wisdom. And uh, Lord, help us to daily search the scriptures and to seek thy face in them and to seek your direction. Father, the path of life is narrow, the path that leads to eternal life. But what a joyous path it is. And it leads into the eternal day, leads into the eternal city. And Father, one day we'll make our last move. And one day the pearly gates will open. And one day we will leave behind all sorrow. We'll leave behind all sin. We'll leave behind all fretting. There will never be a storm. There will never be an angry word. All of that is for the child of God. But we live upon an earth now where all around us we see some strange things. And we hear some things that our ears have never heard before. And uh, we're seeing some things our eyes have never seen before. And we're living, we believe, in the last days. And uh, we certainly believe that the times will be dangerous. They'll be hard to deal with. But we're glad that our God is great. But thank you that as great as he is, he also deals with us in tenderness and sweetness. And Father, help us to learn from this and help us to take upon the nature of our Father. And we know that you want us to be like Jesus, but to be like Jesus would mean that we'd be filled with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit would produce in our life the fruit of the Spirit, love and joy and peace and gentleness and goodness and meekness and temperance. And these things that are the qualities of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and we would certainly want them to be seen in us. And Father, help us not to let our minds wander, but help our minds to be concentrated solely upon you. Now, Lord, we pray that you'll speak to our heart tonight. This prayer we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Our God is not like anyone or anything. Now think about that again. Our God is not like anyone or anything. He is everywhere present at the same time. He is as much with the people who are saved in Japan as He is with us right now. He knows the thoughts of every man, woman, boy, and girl. He knows what's going through my mind just as well as He knows what's going through your mind right now. He is not a man. He is not a woman. Although there are characteristics given to Him that help us understand, that describe Him, that help us to understand Him better, but yet God is a spiritual being, and He is so unlike us and so unlike any thing that we know and understand. Therefore, the Bible says, God reveals Himself. He's chosen to do so. Now, how do you understand someone who's unlike anyone else? How do you understand someone that is not like anything that we know? I'm so glad that He condescended, in my opinion, to step down to a position where we might understand Him in some ways. I'm glad for that. And so He's chosen to reveal Himself through His Word. And He's chosen to reveal Himself through nature. And He's chosen to reveal Himself through the person of Jesus Christ. We're spending time now on this earth getting to know Him. We will be doing that same thing when we get to heaven. We will be understanding Him and knowing Him and serving Him. Now, I don't know about you, but we could stop right there and have enough to praise God for throughout the endless ages of eternity. Unlike anyone, unlike anything, but yet He has chosen to reveal Himself to people like you and me. But yet, God is not, li not unlike other things. For instance, God loves and hates and feels. And the same thing is said of us. We love, we hate, we feel. And so in, their, in one sense of the word, He is like us so that we might be able to understand Him. And I believe this passage of Scripture here reveals two things about God. That He's great, but yet in all of His greatness, He's also a gentle, loving, caring God. Read this psalm and you'll see woven through it fragments of iron and steel, but fragments of velvet and wool. That which is very hard and cold, but that which is very warm and appealing and loving. But yet, that's the God that we serve. Now, what can we say about Him from this passage of Scripture? Many things. For instance, we could say that our God is in the building business. Our God is in the building business. Look at verse 2. The Lord doth build up Jerusalem. He gathereth together the outcast of Israel. Here is a tiny nation. Maybe somewhere around the size of New Jersey. Maybe a little larger than that. Think about that now. Not the size of the United States. Not the size of Russia not the size of any other, any other nation. It has its own uniqueness. But yet that little country, that little nation, and God chose it to magnify His Son, to reveal Himself to the nations. And so God chose a nation of Israel and began it with one man. One man, just one. And through that one man, Abraham, He made His seed great and the Bible said that his seed would cover the earth like the sand of the sea and like the stars in heaven innumerable there's no other nation like the nation of Israel uh, if you want to 
teach people the belief in God and prove that there is a God. You can use His Word. You can use the change that took place in our life. But you can look at the nation of Israel. Look at the prophecies that God prophesied concerning the nation of Israel and every one of them has come true. Every single one of them. That little nation of Israel is in the news daily. In the news now. And will always be in the news. But God is a God who is in the building business. And He started a little insignificant, no account nation that began with a heathen. Abraham, a, a worshiper of idols, and saved him and built his life and built around that man and his family a great nation. The God that we love and serve is in the building business. Uh, he not only built Jerusalem, but He's building His church. Building His church. Uh, Jesus said, Upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I don't like what I'm seeing in, in America. I don't like what I'm seeing on television. I don't like what I'm hearing on the radio. I don't like what I'm reading in the newspaper. I don't like the idea that we're being presented and our children are be, being presented that the gay lifestyle is just an alternative way of living. I don't like that. And uh, uh, I, I really was perturbed uh, and disturbed uh, about uh, this uh, character uh, that's on one of these programs, uh, Married with Children, the female character. And she was talking about how, how thrilled she was to be one of the first actresses to come out of the closet and to reveal her lifestyle. And, and she uh, was going to uh, be involved in, in a, uh, a marriage that were of two women. And they were going to adopt a, a child. And they said, that's a home and that's a marriage. That is not a home. That is not a marriage. And now we're hearing the gay and lesbian pride and, and gay and lesbian lifestyle being propagated. And that's an awful, terrible thing. And, and I do not want my grandchildren uh, to uh, hear that kind of thing. I want them to know that that's a sin and that's evil and that's wrong. And I don't want to have to worry about uh, going to a store or going to a mall and worry about my little grandchildren, my, uh, little, the little boys or the girls being molested by someone there. And it looks like that this kind of a thing is flourishing. But my dear friend, let me say one thing. God's church will continue to grow. He will continue to build His church and Satan and all of the demons uh, that are behind Him will not tear down God's church. We're on the winning side. And he's building. He's building his church. He's building his people. Now, uh, this building, uh, this wood and, and clay and mortar and earth and everything that you see here on these grounds, that's not the church. That is, the, they, even though they belong to the Lord, the church is you and me who he has saved by his blood. We are his church. And he's building us. He's building his church. And he's building his people. And can I insert this here? He wants to build our character. He wants to build our character. Let me say again. Let me say this again. God is far more concerned about your character than He is your ministry. A preacher, an associate, a deacon, a Sunday school teacher, a, a bus worker, that is important. That is important. The work of God is important. And uh, when Brother Ron stands up here to give an appeal uh, for workers, uh, he shouldn't have to beg and plead. There should be someone here that would say, I will fill that position. We need people to drive uh, the van. Somebody ought to step forward and say, I'll do that. You see, God will use you and wants to use you. And uh, uh, I'm simply saying tonight that's important, but I am saying this, God's more concerned uh, with our character. Uh, in the... Uh, later years of life in which I find myself, I'm finding myself recognizing more and more and more that God wants me to just be right. And when I find myself in uh, different situations, I find myself asking this question, what is right? Regardless of what other people think, regardless of how it looks, uh, regardless of what people may say, the question I want to ask is, is it right? Because I want to be right in character. Uh, so I, I, do, I do know this. Uh, you can project an image to people, but if the heart is not right, it's not going to amount to anything as far as the glory of God's concerned. Um, you can blow a lot of smoke. You can talk a good talk. And you can get engulfed in, in things. 
And I can say this because uh, I was a young preacher one time and enamored with the ministry. And here lately I've had the uh, occasion to talk with a lot of young preachers. And, and young preachers do a lot of talking. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and I'm going to go over here and preach here and I'm going to go over and preach. And, and I'm, I know what they're saying and I, know, I thank the, 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 the God for the thrill of it, but I, I know what they're saying. I'll be seen, I'll be heard. And the thought comes to my mind that, that that doesn't matter. It's what you accomplish in the Spirit of God that counts. That's the thing that's going to last. Now listen to me tonight. Listen. I'm not going to take time to ask you to turn there. But 1 Corinthians chapter 3 talks about the judgment seat of Christ. Here's what it says. When we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, our works are going to be tested by fire. What fire? What does the Bible say about His Word? It is a fire that burns. I believe at the judgment seat of Christ, this book's going to be there. And your works, my works, are going to be tested by the fire of this book. Now listen to me, if I did it for myself, if I did it to be seen of men, if I did it because I feel it makes me feel good, if I did it because I get some kind of a rush out of it, if I did it because I wanted to have power, when this book tests all of that, you know what's going to happen? It's going to go up in smoke. But if I've preached a sermon, if I've taught a lesson, if I've gone on visitation, if I've taken some food to somebody, if I've given an offering to someone, and I did that because I love the Lord, and if I did that because I love the person, when the fire of this book tests that work, you know what's going to happen? It's going to be gold. And it's going to remain. Now watch, it'll be mine then, it'll be mine then that in some way and somehow will last throughout the endless ages of eternity. Any crown that I win, it will be my privilege then to cast it at the feet of the Lord Jesus as a token to Him for what I have done. But wait, as the Word of God tests my work and yours, only what is left that's real and genuine will we be able to lay at the Savior's feet. I've lived long enough and I know mankind well enough and I know myself well enough to know this. So much of what we do is wood, hay, and stubble. Because if we don't get our way, if we don't get the recognition if it doesn't go our way, then, well, we're all upset and uh, we're going to be heard. and We're going to let people know. Well, let me ask you this. What's more important? What's real in your life? What's real in my life? Or that I be heard? Or that I get what I want? No. I think the real test is this. What am I doing that is real and genuine that will stand the test of God's, the fiery judgment of God's Word that will last forever? Now that's the kind of life God wants to build. I believe that with all of my heart. Building. God is in the building business. Building His nation. Building His church. Building His people. And building character in our life. Now let me just uh, pause here tonight. And I know I'm not going to get through with this message tonight. I'm going to, I'll cut it short. I'm not going to get through with it. And I'll finish it next week. But I will say this. I would rather have, I would rather have something that is real. And it might not receive the accolades of the public. but it receives the stamp of God's approval. I would rather have that. I, I, would, I would love for us to build a new auditorium. I would love that. I would love for us to build 
a new gymnasium, a new family life center. I would love for us to have some things that appeals to young couples, that appeals to singles, that appeals to teenagers. And let me say this, there is nothing wrong with that. Let me say this, if we could build, if, if it was God's will, and we could build a family life center where our ladies could come and they could do some things that would help them physically and mentally and, and socially and spiritually, there is nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with building something for our teenagers. And I get a little perturbed when I hear adults saying, oh, that's not spiritual. Well, let me ask you this question. Do you care about the lives of teenagers? I'd much rather for them to have a gymnasium sitting down here where they can play basketball and where they could play some kind of sports and be safe and be in a Christian atmosphere than to go over here to the park somewhere where there's drugs. Let the church build something for them rather than the world building something for them because if the church builds it, we can run it. And let me say this. And I don't want to get into a personal thing, but let me say this. I've been preaching now for these 38 years and still doing it because some people cared about me. There were some men and women that cared enough about me to give me their time and to give me their love. And you know what? One day when we get to heaven, there's going to be some little ladies that sit in our church that never preached a sermon, that never taught a Sunday school class, that didn't have any money. But every sermon I've ever preached for the glory of God, they're going to get a reward from that. That's far more important than any other thing I can think of. I would, I would love to have those things. But if God doesn't see fit to give us those things, and if it's His will for us, if we never build another auditorium, if he builds into the life of our people a quality lifestyle for the glory of God that makes a difference, then we ought to be thrilled with that as well. Quality. God is in the building business. His nation, His church, His people, our character. Number two, God is in the healing business. Not only is He in the building business, He is in the healing business. Look at verse 3. He healeth the broken in heart. Do you know what would be the best thing that could happen to some Christians? Not that they win the lottery. Not that they marry some gorgeous movie star or some handsome sports figure. More important, listen to me, I think it'd be more important to some Christians and help them more if God just absolutely broke their heart. We don't like it, but I'm going to tell you what, we need it. There are too many hard hearts. There are too many cold hearts. There are too many Christians who have two or three cars who live in a nice house who pay their bills and they're hard on others. And I'm not saying that's true of every Christian. I wouldn't say that at all. I'm not saying it's wrong to, to have things, but I am saying this. I think sometimes the best thing that could happen to some Christians is, is that God just breaks their heart. And sometimes He'll do it. Sometimes you get, you get a little proud. God will bring you down. Did you know God hates the proud look? Read your Bible. God hates the proud look. Did you know the Bible tells me that God will take the humble and the lowly and will lift them up and will bypass the man or woman that's filled with pride? Man, I'm glad God can do that. I'm glad God can do that. I thank the Lord that I kept, that He's allowed me to keep some things from my, from my youth. When I was a young man, I remember that God gave me a, a tender heart. And there were some things about little children that broke my heart. 
And there were some things about seniors that broke my heart. And poor people. And I don't want to get, I don't want to pa get past that. As a matter of fact, I'd like to have more of it. And lately I've gotten into a, a habit, and I think it's a good habit, of praying for people that I don't even know. I was driving down Old Toronto this morning. And as I was driving down Old Toronto, I saw a, la a, a little lady walking down the street, and she was bent over. And I could tell that she couldn't raise all the way up. And as I got closer by the clothes that she had on, I could tell she was poor. And I don't know, for some reason, God just broke my heart. And I just started, to, I couldn't stop and pick her up or anything like that. But I just prayed for her. And for about five minutes, I just prayed for her. Lord, I said, Lord, I don't know her name. I don't know anything about her. But she just looks poor. And I looked at her face. I looked in the mirror as I passed by. And I looked at her face. And, and it looked like a sad face. And I don't know. But it looked that way. And I just prayed for her. And I said, Lord, if this lady is not saved, I don't know her name, but you do. Send somebody to save her. If she, to lead her to the Lord. If she is saved, maybe she's struggling. Maybe she doesn't have enough money. Then help her out. That might seem foolish to you. That might seem silly to you. But I hope I, 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 my personal feeling is I hope I never get away from that. I pray that I can feel sorry for young couples just starting out. And they're struggling and they need some help from time to time. And I don't want to ever get to the point where I say, well, I had to work my way through. I made it myself. They'll have to do the same. I hope I never get that hard. Because God has to have a way of taking what little you have away from you. And so the Bible says here, watch it, He healeth the broken in heart and bindeth up their wounds. Isn't that something? Now, I'm glad He can do it for others, but I'm glad He can do it for me when I need it. Amen? And then number three, God is in the understanding business. God is in the understanding business. Look at verse 5. Great is our Lord... And of great power, his understanding is infinite. There's no situation that he can't control. There is nothing that can happen to you. There's nothing that, come into your, that can come into your life that he cannot control. Listen to this. Whatever the complexities of your situation, God understands it perfectly. Whatever the complexities of your situation, God understands it perfectly. For the last month, I guess, there's something been going on and on in my mind. And I'll wake up in the middle of the night several times and think about it. And I'm forced to, to pray about this thing and, and I just do not know what God's saying. He hasn't given an answer yet. And to me, it's a complexing thing, and I don't like it. But I'm not going to do anything foolish. And I'm not going to hurry through it. I'm going to wait and let God tell me what He's doing. And it may seem very complex to me, but it's not too complex for Him. He understands every situation, and He knows what He's doing. Remember Sunday, the statement I made? Let me make it again. Wherever you're going, God's already been there. Wherever you're going, God has already been there. Now, I'm going to stop right there. And, Clint, that's just the introduction. I wish Harold was here tonight to hear that. Call him, Judy, and tell him. The preacher just preached his introduction tonight. No, don't do it. He'll have a heart attack. And he wouldn't believe you anyway. But that's just, that's just the introduction to the, to, the, to the message tonight. The greatness and the gentleness of our God. Hmm. Look at verse 6. The Lord lifteth up the meek. Now meekness is not weakness, but it is power under control. The Lord lifteth up the meek. He casteth the wicked down to the grounds. And on and on and on it goes. I'll finish the message next Wednesday evening if we're here. And... Uh, 
if uh, we're not here and we're in heaven, then that'll be all right. Amen? Amen. And if you're here and I'm not here, maybe Clint can finish it. You can give him my notes. <laughs> and we'll let him finish it. Just always remember, God is on the side of the south. All right, let's pray together and ask God to speak to our heart. Father, thank you that you know about us, care about us, love us. Thank you that you know where we're going. You've already been there. Use us for your glory and for your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Boy, they, they sneak up on you quick, don't they? <laughs> All righty. We were greatly encouraged in the message to provide van drivers. I got that out of it. How about you? <laughs> um, so let's get some, okay? Enough time spent. We need two or three fellas that can help out. If you'll see Brother Larry right after, or ladies, um, if you'll see Brother Larry right after the service, he'll sign you up 